<laughs> okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Buffalo, New York. This is the 16th of May, 2007, approximately 10.15 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes, so Michael A. Alturi, Sr., uh, born on May 10, 1926, in Schenectady, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I graduated from high school in uh, June of uh, 1944. Shortly after, I took my physical for uh, service. That was in July and uh, was called up in uh, September, mm -hmm. September 8th of 44. Okay. I'm going to go back a second. Um, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes. Uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, maybe about 4 o'clock, uh, of course in Schenectady, living with, uh, uh, we had lived in a two-family home. Uh, the grandparents were upstairs, we lived downstairs. And my mom and dad, at the time uh, that I heard about Pearl Harbor, I had come uh, home from a uh, movie uh, at the uh, local theater, uh, Palace Theater. And again, it was about 4 o'clock, uh, uh, December 7th, and uh, I walked in, in the house. My mom and dad were sitting at the uh, table. They had a radio on them, a small plastic radio of the time. And uh, uh, my dad said uh, they bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, of course, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was and what that meant. Was I was 15. And, uh, the next day, uh, we went to school. I was I had just started uh, in September, not Terrace High School, and uh, the uh, they announced uh, that the president would be speaking. So they had radios on in the uh, oh I think it was in the study hall. And so we're all called to go to the study hall. There were a couple of big study halls. And we heard the president uh, declaring war. Again, uh, had no real impact other than uh, we we're going to go to war, whatever that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after that, uh, some of the fellows uh, that were 17 or so or were seniors, I, I was a freshman, started going in service and then we started getting the full impact. Uh, about a year before that, one of my uncles was drafted. They had started the uh, selective service, mm -hmm. and he was in. Uh, he was later discharged, uh, uh, unable to um, meet the uh, requirements of the service. He was a quiet uh, gentleman that uh, just didn't adjust. So the uh, next few years, uh, uh, we kept reading uh, how badly, uh, well, the ne next year, actually, how badly the uh, American forces were doing. Uh, Japanese were overrunning the uh, South Pacific, all the islands there. Uh, it was just a bad time in 1942. Uh, just going back a little bit, in December, uh, at Christmas time, right after the war started, uh, it was a sad Christmas. Uh, it was midwinter, of course, but uh, uh, I was we had a family of uh, uh, nine children. I was the oldest, and uh, all, they were all the younger uh, children were looking forward to Christmas and Santa Claus and the holidays. Uh, it was just a dreary time. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow or other, we got through that. Uh, again, in 1942, we were still taking a beating in Japan, in Europe, and through the uh, period of early 43, I think we started moving on in Africa and starting to take the initiative. When I got in service uh, back in uh, September of 44, uh, the D-Day had begun in June of that year. Uh, we were doing great, uh, pushing the Germans all the way through France and back into 
uh, into Germany. The, uh, suddenly there was a German offensive at Christmas time in 1944, and that became the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. It was a, again a terrible period uh, that we write about. Uh, I was in uh, Fort Bragg in train. I go back to say, when you went into the service, were you drafted or did you enlist? I uh, got drafted. Yeah. Uh, the okay. reason for that was that I uh, wanted to finish high school. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my friends uh, joined up and uh, didn't finish, but I wanted to finish high school. I planned at that time to go to college and uh, they were not realistic because I knew the first uh, step would be uh, going in service. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, we uh, got drafted, the, uh, got, I got the call up, and, uh, as I mentioned, in July. And uh, well, that was the physical, I went to Albany for the physical, and then later on uh, was called up uh, uh, September 8th of 44. Uh, I remember to this day that the uh, we have reported to the fire station on Erie Boulevard, and uh, it was a clear, crystal clear morning. Uh, they bus us over to uh, Albany, and then from Albany we went to uh, Fort Dix. Got there late in the evening, and it was, uh, we had gone without supper or anything, so they graciously served us uh, an orange and a sandwich. Uh, about, I think about 11 o'clock at night. Next morning, the routine of the Army started. Uh, we were up early. Uh, Reveille must have been 5 o'clock or whatever. Then they started the routine of shots and uh, uh, dentistry and uh, the whole thing. So within a couple weeks, uh, oh, one highlight was that uh, we were there in Fort Dix for about, oh, almost two weeks. So I did get, get a leave to go home, uh, back to Schenectady. It was just a weekend pass. Mm -hmm. So we got to Schenectady and uh, here I was, uh, it was September, late September now, uh, in a uniform. And uh, uh, most of the guys didn't come home for years, but I was home in two weeks. Mm -hmm. But uh, So that was a highlight. Then back to Fort Dix and then subsequently to uh, Fort Bragg for training. Uh, at Fort Bragg for about uh, four months from September to January. Then we had a delay and route back to Schenectady and then we boarded the... Uh, what kind of training did you do? We did the uh, infantry training for 11 weeks and field artillery training for seven weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, that was on the 105 howitzers. Uh, the, uh, they made a lot of noise. Uh, I became the gunner on the howitzer, and uh, I was sighting a lot. The, uh, they, at that time, they were nothing like they are uh, today. But uh, we all took change positions, loading the uh, gun with the shells and all, putting the uh, ammunition in. But I settled to, uh, I became the gunner. The, uh, we, Left Fort Bragg in January of uh, January 27th or so, 145. As I mentioned, a short delay in route. Uh, it was supposed to be a five-day delay. Went back to Schenectady, but it was uh, terrible weather. Uh, I think it was the most snow of, of the uh, winters that I could have remembered. Uh, so we couldn't go anywhere. There was no gas. Uh, no, uh, we didn't have a car. And all we did was go to the bowling alley, which was relatively nearby, and uh, back to the camp again, back to Fort uh, Dix, and then they moved us to uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, where we did some training on boarding uh, ships uh, with our full pack and guns and everything, helmets. Uh, at the time, I weighed, uh, I think I weighed 119 when I went in. I think the equipment, the gun, and the helmet were more than I did. But uh, we made it. And shortly after, we got shipped out of Fort Meade into uh, Camp Kilmer. And uh, that was February 27th of 45. 
And uh, all I remember there was that it was evening, looked up when we were going up the gangplank, and all I could see was a little lighted section of the ship, and it said Queen Elizabeth. We boarded the ship, uh, and next morning we sailed uh, to Europe. Now, did you go as a replacement? Yes. Yeah, we were uh, uh, replacements, and when we got on the ship, we were told there were 17,000 troops on the ship. Uh, wax, uh, women, officers, uh, replacements. Uh, many uh, of the replacements were uh, fellows that had gone home, had been uh, injured, wounded, whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, rehabbed and back, uh, going back to Europe. It took us seven days to get to uh, uh, Scotland. We zigzagged across the ocean, back and forth, and uh, it was quite a sight. Mm -hmm. We saw the whales when we went out to uh, left shore on this side. The the biggest, one of the biggest thrills of my life was uh, Go ahead and begin. Yeah, that was something. Uh, again, we got there in seven days. Luckily, there were no submarines that could catch us because we were faster than the subs. And we zigzagged, and uh, it was inspiring seeing uh, the port of Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, we didn't spend very much time there. We trained all the way down to Southampton South in England. Uh, it was a port at the uh, southern part of uh, England. Uh, stayed there maybe a couple of days, cold, it was terribly cold. Uh, we were in tents, and we were, well, they had pot body stoves in the tents. And we, uh, in order to heat that, get some wood for the stoves, we uh, pulled up the uh, boards on the, the walk and uh, used those to burn those. Uh, shortly after we boarded the ship uh, and we uh, crossed the, the channel, that didn't take long. Uh, we landed at Maharb in France and uh, they took us right to a warehouse and there was a band playing and must have been, it wasn't Glenn Miller but it, it sounded like Glenn Miller. Great. Uh, shortly after we uh, they load us, loaded us on trains and, well, I'm sorry, it was on uh, trucks, six by sixes. Uh, one of the first stops we made was a uh, French uh, chateau, and they put us up for the night, and then we went on to uh, several other places. Um, I made a note of it to myself at the time. One was in Gervais, France. Then we moved again into uh, Verviers, Belgium, again in a warehouse, and there uh, we were uh, bunked with uh, several of the, uh, either the 101st or 82nd Airborne uh, fellows, uh, veterans that had been uh, wounded at the Battle of the Bulge. They, uh, they were so uh, here we were, 18-year-olds, and there were veterans that were several years older, but having seen bat, uh, cap, combat and all that, they were ferocious. They, they, you, you almost didn't think they were part of our army. Uh, uh, we uh, then uh, got on the, the six by sixes after being in Belgium for maybe an overnight. Uh, and by the way, we stopped for, uh, they, they let us go, to, we were in downtown, in the small city, in the small town of the, uh, the Rivers, and they, they had a chocolate shop. We went in there, and uh, they had in the showcase pieces of chocolate, not very many. We could buy one piece of chocolate, and that was a thrill. Uh, we did, and again, shortly later, we went, went on our uh, six by six, they loaded us up again. We got back into uh, France. I think we're, well, I know we were, we were now we were third army replacements. And uh, we're, they moved us to Belgium first because uh, they, 
I think they were expecting another problem with the Germans coming in again, but, uh, and we were replacements for that. Back into France, we saw Luxembourg, uh, and it was another small country that we went right by. Back into France, and then finally we uh, crossed over the Rhine into uh, Germany. One of the uh, things that sticks out in my mind is seeing kids as we trucked into Germany. Uh, little kids begging for uh, cow gummy gum and chocolates. And, and we had been so conditioned, uh, anti-German, that we wouldn't even give them anything at that time. Uh, but we wound up in uh, Gemunden, Germany, uh, which was a small town. And then we trucked again, but we're tented there. And all the time that we traveled, uh, we could see the German, uh, well, the planes that had been crashed and all around us, uh, all the Allied planes uh, from the dogfights that were going on. Uh, we saw planes, uh, our planes, going overhead, bombing the uh, Germans in front of us. And of course, the uh, British bombed at night. We wound up in the uh, Butler Nazi youth camp. This was a small town up in the hills. And it, uh, in that camp, uh, that's about the time that Roosevelt died. Uh, it was a bad time for uh, some of us because they, they fed us some chicken that. Uh, wasn't too good. We had we all had some GI problems. Now, how did you feel when you heard about the death of the president? Do you he been the president most all well, all of you? Yeah, you know, all mine. But it was a depressing time because he he had been uh, through the whole war mm -hmm. and was our leader in effect. And when we heard that uh, Truman took over, we had no idea who Truman was. Uh, he, he was the new president. Mm -hmm. So that was a time that was, we were felt sad about that. Shortly after that, we, uh, and again, this was a place where we, uh, we, were, we took some prisoners that were coming up the road. The uh, recon outfits were traveling at night. It was, it was, if you can visualize it, it was pitch black. There was no light anywhere. So we, we pulled guard duty, my buddy and I. And by the way, the Germans were all around us. We knew that because we saw their equipment and whatever, and they took off when we got there. Uh, it was so dark that uh, when we pulled guard duty in the motor pool, it was just a little field where our trucks were. All we did was stay in the cab, the cab of the, the trucks. And every time we heard a sound, we. Uh, here we were, two 18-year-old guys that were, uh, we didn't know what to do, but anyway, we stayed there and it got light again and we were happy about that. What kind of weapon did you have? We had, uh, at that time, because we were uh, artillery one of uh, carbines, mm -hmm. uh, before that we trained with uh, M1s. So, as a replacement, you went into an artillery unit? Well, or, I know you were artillery, but... Yeah, at that point, uh, they called up some, re they came into the outfit and they called up some of the guys. Uh, I didn't get called. I was, boy, I was unhappy about that. Uh, and I know that uh, here I was a gunner and I figured I was the guy that was going to be going in. But luckily, uh, as it turned out, I didn't get called. Uh, then we moved. Many of my buddies were still there. Then we moved into uh, Beirut, Germany, which was right outside of the. Uh, Czech border, mm -hmm. and again, the, the, our planes were flying over. Uh, Hitler died just about that time, just after Roosevelt, and there was rumors that the war would be ending soon. Mm -hmm. uh, one night, uh, apparently somebody uh, lit a fire or whatever. Uh, the German plane came over and there was, uh, with, with the rockets, they uh, hit the uh, camp. And we all scattered. Uh, 
I, uh, we left our tent, put, the, put my shoes on right away, and went to a root cellar, which was nearby. Uh, it's like a dug-in uh, cellar with cover and all. But uh, we were all so uh, scared about that that I uh, put my boots on backwards. I didn't know that I'm backwards till so we got back. The, uh, well, luckily again, we, uh, by the way, uh, anybody right there, when we got there, it was about seven days after they were liberated, or the, our, our advance troops went through there, uh, there was a wine cellar, a huge wine cellar, because it was a popular place that uh, Hitler's and, and others uh, used to go to. We, uh, we tried to get into the wine cellar, but we were barred from doing so by the officers who happened to take advantage of that, their position. Uh, within a matter of days, we were, uh, the war ended. Uh, it was an afternoon, uh, May 8th. The, uh, all I saw was a, uh, we didn't hear it, we didn't have any uh, loudspeakers or anything yet. But I did notice that there was a uh, uh, notice posted on one of the trees, just nailed to the tree. And it's, uh, in fact, I kept a copy of it. That uh, was the, that's the actual one that you found nailed to the, the tree? Yeah, you know, it was on the tree, and it was afternoon, and whoever typed it made a, he uh, spelled King, uh, King K I N K. So it was fast in putting it together. Uh, he indicated that uh, uh, Prime Minister Churchill will make an official announcement at 1500 today, that would be 3 o'clock. And the Germans were repeatedly asked if they knew and understood the significance of the armistice, and they replied yes. And they said it would be carried out in Germany. Uh, according to the Czech Patriot Radio, the Germans fighting in Prague, there was still a lot of fighting going on, mm -hmm. just over the border. Uh, what was happening was that the Russians were moving on the Germans and uh, the Germans were rushing out to our side. And in fact, uh, that afternoon, uh, I think the, uh, one of the officers or someone got a hold of some uh, barrels of beer, uh, confiscated them, and the, uh, we ran out to the, we were in the open field and the German planes came in uh, apparently running away from the Russians, but there were fighter planes and they swooped over us and uh, tipped their wings. And of course we ran in all directions, but they tipped their wings and they came in to surrender. So we're lucky there too. After the war ended, uh, shortly after we, uh, I got the notice to, uh, well, I was told that uh, there were two, several of us uh, that we reported to a uh, organization in the Erlangen, Germany. That was a former uh, German ar army base, and it, uh, we were told it was the 36th Machine Records Unit. Now I went from a uh, trained 105 howitzer to a Machine Records Unit, which I didn't know what, what, what that was, but. Luckily, uh, apparently it was from my uh, background that I had passed some tests and I had a high school graduate and uh, I got this outfit, it was assigned to the Third, third Army Headquarters uh, and it was a break uh, because my other buddies had gone on to their uh, different divisions. Uh, in fact, one of the guys was wounded, uh, a good friend. Uh, who I later met uh, when we came back from overseas. The uh, work that we did in the uh, machine records unit was uh, primarily for the Third Army. We kept track of all the uh, German records, or rather the, uh, our records uh, for the Army, uh, who was wounded. Uh, we, we got the morning reports, and they, uh, one, of our, one of the groups transferred the uh, morning reports into uh, information that we put on our uh, tabulating machines, uh, key punch operator, Q 
keep on sort of machines and so on. Uh, again, I was very fortunate to get to be assigned to that outfit. It was the Third Army uh, unit. So as a result of that, we put the word the Third Army patch. Uh, later, uh, we moved to Munich and were there about six months. And that was uh, also good to be. In what ways? Well, the, uh, we, it was almost like having an office job. We, uh, like a nine to five. The, uh, well, there wasn't much to do at night, but at least we could go around and uh, be free from the demands of the uh, uh, wearing your or marching or anything like that. It was just just a in fact we uh, nearby uh, our uh, building, uh, which was a former. Uh, German Air Force uh, building. Uh, nearby the building was a uh, encampment of uh, displaced persons, uh, and they were waiting to be shipped back to their own countries. But one day we went down there and they had a dance uh, as best they could. They had the instruments and they played. The, so we went, went to that. Shortly later, they. Uh, and by the way, they lived in Czech, so it was just a just a terrible uh, uh, living arrangement. They were used for uh, German labor uh, on the fields and in the factories and so on. Uh, and they were from every country that you can imagine, Hungary, Romania, Italy, all over. But they left shortly after and we, you could see them when they were leaving, they were on, we took, uh, the Americans took them by truck back to their countries and they would have flags on their, uh, on the truck waving the flags and you knew what country they were at, going to. It was just a point of sight. And they called them DPs, displaced persons. And then, I guess that happened all throughout Germany. But Munich and southern Germany was just a beautiful place to be. It was not unlike uh, upstate New York. In fact, the weather was about the same. And it was springtime and then summer. And we went through the early part of the winter, then shipped to uh, Bad Tolls, which was down in the Alps. And there we uh, were assigned, although in Munich we were in a separate building, and it was great. Now we were assigned to a German, former German uh, uh, garrison. But there too we were able to uh, enjoy the uh, nearby Alps. We went skiing. We played basketball at night at the gymnasium. Uh, the local townspeople did our laundry, uh, and we paid them. Uh, we bartered. We paid them in uh, soap and chocolates and toothpaste, whatever. So it was an interesting time there. Shortly after that, we moved up to uh, Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, we were expecting to go to some other city, but we moved to uh, Heidelberg, a university city, which was even better than the, uh, just a glorious place. Was we there right a lot of damage town. there? Or, Pardon me? Was there a lot of damage from the war? Or? In Heidelberg, there wasn't. Uh, no, it, uh, it was a university town. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, we were right downtown, and the university was right there. Uh, we were in a former Woolworth building, right downtown, just like the Woolworth building that they had here, five and ten and all that. But and the uh, yeah, we set up in there. Now we became uh, where before we serviced the Third Army, uh, we became the uh, organization for the whole uh, United States Forces of the European Theater, and that uh, we had a different uh, patch that we could wear. We, uh, I signed up for uh, classes at the university at night, and uh, that was interesting. We, uh, I had a uh, life art course and a commercial art course. Uh, was, I wanted to go into art, uh, or I thought that would be my field. Mm -hmm. The uh, the model in the uh, life art course was beautiful. 
Cheering sack. But we, uh, it was only a matter of about a week or so, well, a couple of weeks maybe, and uh, I, I had to drop the courses because we were shipping out. We shipped up to uh, the northern part of Germany, uh, getting ready to come home. We left uh, in July of uh, 45. So I had been in Germany and overseas for the better part of almost a year and a half. I was anxious to get home, and as were most of the others. Before you talk about that, um, you mentioned here in, in the form you filled out, uh, that you completed, um, that you had a, you talked about your officer who was in charge, your commanding officer uh, of your unit, um, your headquarters unit. Uh, being the son of the head of the American Red Cross? Yes, that was interesting. He, uh, that's what was his name? The uh, person you... His name was Captain O'Connor. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember his first name, but uh, he was a uh, fine gentleman. He, uh, he, in fact, he uh, obviously had some influence through his dad because his wife was there and she was in the Red Cross. And they lived right uh, in a private home uh, away from our uh, our, uh, our building, mm -hmm. uh, but a nice gentleman. And one day, uh, this was in July, uh, we saw an entourage of motorcycles and uh, limousines coming up the Lubbenstrasse, coming to our building. And sure enough, it was uh, George Patton, General Patton. Mm -hmm. uh, he came in, and uh, we the organization. The, we only had about 60 uh, troops in there. That, that was a total unit. Uh, but he came in and inspected. Uh, talk, I talked to him. He uh, was quite a guy. He, uh, he was at least six feet. Uh, all the pictures you see of him but with the uh, shiny helmet, the pearl handle pistol, uh, shiny boots. He was the soldier soldier. And he chatted me. He asked how everything was going. And I, I said, fine, sir. I, if I thought of it, I'd have taken this picture, but I <laughs> didn't have a camera. But at the time, I was a mail clerk when I first got there. And uh, I saw two medals that, that had come in. One was to be a, not a silver star, but a bronze star. And there was one other. And I think the reason he came, of course, they didn't share it with the troops, but certainly not with a private, but was to present the medals to the uh, uh, Captain O'Connor for an uh, outstanding work mm -hmm. in organizing the uh, the unit. It was a mobile unit and they moved right across, uh, right back of the uh, army. You did mention also his voice was rather different than George C. Scott. Uh, I, I just couldn't believe it when I uh, when, when I said hello to him and he talked to me. He had a squeaky voice. Here was a, this big guy, six mm -hmm. a squeaky voice. Uh, and I think George C. Scott, w w with his voice, and the, although his his uh, acting was was great, uh, but his voice did not fit the George Patton that I knew. Mm -hmm. It was just un unbelievable. Yeah, he's quite a guy, though. Now you mentioned you also had an encounter with a famous artist. Oh yes, uh, Norman Rockwell was. Uh, in Erlangen, when I first reported to the outfit in that garrison, <coughs> uh, he was there drawing pictures in the uh, what they said temporary Red Cross club, uh, and he was just drawing caricatures and the, as he did for the Saturday, Saturday evening post. Mm -hmm. uh, just a short guy in an army uniform. I'm sure he was special services, uh, but that was quite an experience to see him doing what he was doing. And now, it was, right. was he a civilian or was he actually in the he was military? A civilian. Okay. But special services, uh, uh, in fact, I ran into Mickey Rooney too, and Mickey Rooney was in special services. Mm -hmm. And he was in, I, uh, when I was a mail clerk, uh, Mickey Rooney was standing in front of me at, the, at the, our uh, APO, they call it, Army Postal Office. By the way, he was only about uh, four, four uh -huh. feet tall. Did you talk to him at all? Yes, oh yeah, we were chatting. Yeah. He's quite a guy. 
But back to Norman Rockwell, the, uh, I subsequently became a, a very good fan of his. Uh, in fact, uh, we've got all kinds of plates and everything uh, mm -hmm. and pictures that, that he drew. And, uh, Did you ever write to him or anything after the war? Or no, I didn't. We, uh, yeah, I'm just curious. No. I know he, went, he had quite a career after, mm -hmm. and he had quite a career before, but mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of uh, reading on him. And in fact, when we went up to uh, Vermont, yeah, we went right by his place. Uh, we had a tour, mm -hmm. so we didn't stop there. But it was pointed out where he was born and where he lived and so on. Yeah, it was quite an experience. We saw Paul at Goddard talking about the uh, individuals that were prominent at the time. Paula Goddard was a, a beautiful actress. Uh, we saw her in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina when we were down on our train mm -hmm. when we had a weekend uh, free. Did and you ever see any USO shows at all? After the, uh, yes, in Munich we saw all kinds of USO shows. Uh, Bob Hope and his entourage. Uh, then we also saw a uh, one with uh, Jack Benny and all the prominent people at that time. Uh, that was in uh, nearby. It was either Stuttgart or Frankfurt in a in a stadium there. In fact, I had uh, I still have pictures of the uh, when we met with or saw him there. Okay. So when did you return home? Well. But from uh, we boarded the ship uh, coming home again sometime in July, and that was at uh, Bremerhaven, Germany. Uh, it was a very uh, that Bremerhaven at the time was just a, almost nothing, just a barren buildings, uh, and we were anxious to leave there. We got on a uh, I think it was a Liberty ship coming back. And I've got some pictures of that. Uh, my good friend, my good buddy, was uh, who uh, got called up when we were back in, in the field. He's the one that got hit, that got wounded. But then we, uh, and Byron Hunt was there too. That's also a, the individual that was from Buffalo. Uh, we sailed back. It took us a little bit longer on a victory ship. And we landed, and I think we got back to, uh, I forgot the port that we got back to, but we went to Fort Dix. And within a short period of time, uh, we were discharged and uh, returned home. Happy to get home July 28th, 1946. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Uh, yes, we did. We, uh, well, in 19, uh, I was fond of golf, so I thought it, I couldn't get into uh, art school because they were all filled up at that time. Uh, so I went back up to my first love playing golf. Uh, so I played golf uh, 46, 47. I thought about getting back and uh, going back to school, but I started working in January 47. So in uh, that year, I, no, 48, in 1949, we, uh, I decided to go back. Uh, by this time, I got married in September 49. I was still working as a civilian at a Navy base in Schenectady, Scotia. So I uh, went to school nights on the GI Bill. Went to Union College uh, for five years, nights. Subsequently, uh, as uh, things were developed, we uh, moved from Schenectady to Syracuse. And then uh, uh, the demands of the job became such, and it finally was growing. Uh, so we uh, then moved after five years to uh, Buffalo. Then I went back to school, finished my uh, degree, 
from uh, why well, finished it at uh, UB in uh, 72. Uh, at that point, uh, I was nearing the end of my official government career, but uh, nevertheless, I wanted to uh, uh, get a degree, which was uh, very helpful. And I used uh, a good part of my GI Bill, although some of it expired. Mm -hmm. So I went on my own as well as a GI Bill. Did you ever use the 5220 Club? The 5220 Club uh, was uh, in concert with my ability to play golf. <laughs> that 20 bucks was uh, uh, Probably very, golf very helpful. <laughs> yeah, we signed up for that. I never expected to uh, stay on it as long as I did, but uh, I think I... You didn't max it out? I uh, had six months. <laughs> I didn't break the record. <laughs> Some of the guys did. Twenty bucks at the time was uh, meaningful. Did then you I also work part time, okay. uh, working with my dad. Mm -hmm. Do you join any veterans organizations? I joined the uh, well. I didn't join. The, I joined the DAV, no, not the DAV, the uh, Catholic War Veterans in Schenectady, and we were there for a while, played ball and, that, and all that. But I didn't join it later. I uh, did some other things. But later, uh, in uh, up here in Buffalo, we uh, I had some heart problems, and in about 1989, I retired in 1986 after 40 years uh, government service. I joined the day uh, the. VFW and the American Legion in about 89, mm -hmm. uh, about 90, somewhere there. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't become active in those, I just became a member, became a life member. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a, a member in both organizations. Uh, the, uh, I encourage others to join that too, in fact, uh, they always have a campaign going on. Did you uh, stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? We, um, after we were discharged in uh, 46, that winter, we all, we uh, started a group of New Yorkers when I was back in, uh, in Munich. And we called ourselves the Pentagon Club. And we have a, uh, I drew a plaque with five names on it, and uh, one chap was from Schenectady, I was from Syracuse, uh, two were from Brooklyn, and one from Manhattan. So we became the Pentagon Club. Mm -hmm. And we vowed to uh, get together after we were discharged. And we did. We got together in uh, New York. Went down there in Christmas of 46. And one of the chaps who uh, was a mail clerk at one point, and made a lot of money on the black market. <laughs> um, owned a brand new, when the cars came out, and, well anyway, the, the year the cars came out, he had a brand new car in 1946. We drove up in downtown square in that car, <laughs> the five of us. And I visited all their homes and all that, and uh, they subsequently went on that. Uh, a couple of the fellows became teachers. Uh, Sandy became a biologist, yeah. Got his doctorate. Uh, and uh, that was the only contact we had uh, together. But I wrote to, uh, we kept writing, uh, sending Christmas cards. Uh, I still contact uh, one of the uh, chaps, the fellow from Syracuse, just by way of the Christmas mm -hmm. card. So that bond, uh, I, well, I did write to others, of course, and that I met uh, fellows who uh, subsequently passed on, several of them passed on, but we lost contact. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in service had an effect on your life? I think it had, I, well, first of all, I could, at the time, I felt that there was no, nothing else I, I should do but go in service. I think everybody felt that way. 
and I know all my friends uh, all went in. Uh, how it affected my life? That if it were not for the J.I. Bill, of course, I don't think I ever would have had the opportunity to start uh, and go as far as I did with that. Uh, we, had, we bought our home, our first home, uh, not on the J.I. Bill, but uh, subsequently, uh, uh, in fact, I took over a loan in Schenectady, then we bought one in uh, Syracuse, took over that loan. And uh, I didn't know this, but when we moved to Buffalo, since I didn't, never had a GI loan, I could take out a GI loan, and I did. And uh, that was a great relief uh, financially. So as far as education and uh, housing, and uh, I think it, uh, without that, it would have been a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, the GI Bill was outstanding. Mm -hmm. It was signed in. Uh, I think June 27th, 44. I think it was the same day I graduated from high school. Could you tell us uh, where and when this photograph was taken? If you just hold it up to the camera. This was in the uh, <coughs> well, summertime, of course, in 1945 in Munich. It was there. Uh, uh, well, it was actually the uh, 98 in front of the 98 General Hospital, which was right by our office. The General Hospital was a hospital that we took over. The uh, Americans took over. It was a former German hospital, of course. Uh, so I must have been 19 at that point. No gray hair. <laughs> Although my wife would tell you that I got gray hair early on. Um, could you show, hold up the drawing you made? Showing your roots. Sometime in the, uh, I was trying to keep a record of where I was and what I was doing, and I was going to put this on my uh, canteen cup all the way around, and I never got to it. But this was a rough draft of the Queen Elizabeth, <coughs> and then we, well, well starting with uh, the basic training uh, in Fort Bragg on 105 Howitzers. Then we shipped to uh, overseas on the Queen Elizabeth, landed in Glasgow, Scotland, at the uh, northern western part of uh, eastern western part of England. Shipped down through Southampton, across the Channel, uh, March 9th uh, that we shipped. Then over to uh, Gervais, France, Rivieres, Belgium. All of this by uh, six by six trucks. Uh, then we went by train down into uh, back to France, and then by truck again into Germany because of no trains running. Uh, a couple of the towns that we landed in, or that I kept track of, was can, can you angle it this way a little bit? One was Gemunde, small town. Okay. And then we moved down to Bullard. Well, an interesting thing, and in, uh, I think it was in Gamonde that there was a. Uh, it was around uh, Easter time, Palm Sunday. Yeah, it was Palm Sunday, and we. Uh, I guess it was Tom Sunday. We went to church. They trucked us down to the uh, village. And it was, uh, as all German cities, they had you could, churches with the high spears and all that. It, uh, here we had been indoctrinated that the Germans were anti religious and all that. And all along the roadsides, there were statues of uh, uh, uh crosses and everything else. So we went to that church and uh, we all went in with our helmet. The war was still on. We went in with our full equipment, guns and everything else. You can imagine being in church with the guns and everything. So we sat on one side and the civilians were sitting on the other. We looked at them and they looked at us. 
And I always said to myself at that time and then later that I wonder whose side God is on. Then we went into uh, Beirut, Germany, which was just outside of Czechoslovakia that I mentioned. That, and subsequently the war ended and we wound up in uh, airline Germany, which was a, also a German base. And from there into uh, Munich. And from Munich into uh, then Greece and bad tools in the, in the Alps. So I never did get to finishing this because we finally moved to Heidelberg and then uh, Bremerhaven. So we had quite an experience traveling through uh, Germany, France and Germany, although briefly in France. Mm -hmm. Now you have some photographs in there. Did, were you there when they liberated Dachau? Uh, shortly while we were there, in, they liberated them either April or May, we were there in October, mm -hmm. but the, uh, there were still, were there still some internees there or? Yes, there were internees, several internees, because the, uh, we knew that. Mm -hmm. By the way, it became a Red Cross fund, and you can see the, uh, if you can hold there up, these, Photographs all on this side were taken in. On this one. This one. The, the, uh, right here, yeah. On these two here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, which, are, which is your one? Well, let's see. I think I'm right there. Yeah. Now, did you ever meet any of the Russians at all? Uh, no, not personally. Russians? No, they were on the, uh, mm -hmm. just on the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. One of the oh, disappointments when we were there that uh, the uh, we expected them to go up into Berlin, and uh, the word was that uh, that we would go up to Berlin, but apparently the uh, well, the RGB uh, decided not mm -hmm. not to have the Americans go up there. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, stars and stripes that. Uh, all the, all the troops got, but the, this was uh, when Hitler was killed, or Hitler uh, committed suicide. And it was uh, shortly before it ended. That was, in fact, it was May 3rd. The war ended on May 8th. And Truman took over. And, of course, the big three at the time were Adley, who took over from Churchill, and Stalin, of course. Mm -hmm. And this is the May 8th edition. Yeah, that's the, uh, the actual day the war ended in uh, Europe. Okay, great. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for your interview.